Moby Dick, or, The Whale, by Herman Melville. Chapter 96. The Tri Works. Besides her hoisted boats, an American whaler is outwardly distinguished by her tri works. She presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship. It is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks. The tri works are planted between the foremast and mainmast, the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar, some 10 feet by 8 square, and 5 in height. The foundation does not penetrate the deck, but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron bracing it on all sides, and screwing it down to the timbers. On the flanks it is cased with, wood, and at top completely covered by a large, sloping, battened hatchway. Removing this hatch we expose the great tripods two in number, and each of several barrels capacity. When not in use, they are kept remarkably clean. Sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand, till they shine within like silver punch bowls. During the night watches some cynical old sailors will crawl into them and coil themselves away there for a nap. While employed in polishing them, one man in each pot, side by side, many confidential communications are carried on, over the iron lips. It is a place also for profound mathematical meditation. It was in the left-hand tripod of the Pequot, with the soapstone diligently circling round me, that I was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact, that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid, my soapstone for example, will descend from any point in precisely the same time. Removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks, the bare masonry of that side is exposed penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces, directly underneath the pots. These mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron. The intense heat of the fire is prevented, from communicating itself to the deck, by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works. By a tunnel inserted at the rear, this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates. There are no external chimneys, they open direct from the rear wall. And here let us go back for a moment. It was about nine o'clock at night that the Pequod's tri works were first started on this present voyage. It belonged to Stubb to oversee the business. Already there? Off hatch, then, and start her. You cook, fire the works. This was an easy thing, for the carpenter had been thrusting her shavings into the furnace throughout the passage. Here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the tri works has to be fed for a time with wood, after that no wood is used, except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel. In a word, after being tried out, the crisp, shriveled blubber, now called scraps or fritters, still contains considerable of its sumptuous properties. These fritters feed the flames. Like a plethoric burning martyr, or a self-consuming misanthrope, once ignited, the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body. Would that he consumed his own smoke. For his smoke is horrible to inhale, and inhale it you must, and not only that, but you must live in it for the time. It has an unspeakable, wild, Hindu odor about it, such as may lurk in the vicinity of funereal pyres. It smells like the left wing of the Day of Judgment, it is an argument for the pit. By midnight the works were in full operation. We were clear from the carcass, sail had been made, the wind was freshening, the wild ocean darkness was intense. But that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames, which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues, and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging, as would the famed Greek fire. The burning ship drove on, as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed. So the pitch and, sulfur-freighted brigs of the bold hydriot, canaries, issuing from their midnight harbors, with broad sheets of flame for sails, bore down upon the Turkish frigates, and folded them in conflagrations. The hatch, removed from the top of the works, now afforded a wide hearth in front of them. Standing on this were the Tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners, always the whale ship's stokers. Alt with, huge pronged poles they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding fonts, or stirred up the fires beneath till the snaky flames started, curling, out of the doors to catch them by the feet. 
the smoke rolled away in sullen heaps. To every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil, which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces. Opposite the mouth of the works, on the further side of the wide wooden hearth, was the windlass. This served for a sea sofa. Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire, till their eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards, and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, all these were strangely revealed in, the capricious emblazonings of the works. As they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them, like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro, in their front, the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on, and the sea leapt, and the ship groaned and dived, and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night, and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth, and viciously spat round her on all sides, then the rushing Pequot, freighted with savages, and laden with fire, and burning a corpse, and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her, monomaniac commander's soul. So seemed it to me, as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fireship on the sea. Wrapped, for that interval, in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in, my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night, in particular, a strange, and ever since inexplicable, thing occurred to me. Starting from a brief standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side which leaned against it, in my ears was the low hum of sails. Just beginning to shake in the wind, I thought my eyes were open, I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But, spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by, though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card, by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression, that whatever swift, rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens as turn. A stark, bewildered feeling, as of death, came over me. Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was, somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me? thought I low. In my brief sleep I had turned myself about, and was fronting the ship's stern, with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind, and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night, and the fatal, contingency of being brought by the lee. Look not too long in the face of the fire, O oh man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass, except the first hint of the hitching tiller, believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright, those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief, the glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campagna, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds, of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true, or undeveloped. With books the same. The truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet, but he who dodges hospitals and jails, 
and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, calls Cooper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise, and therefore jolly semicolon not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones, and break the green damp mold with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But, even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, that is, even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up, then, to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness, and there is a cat's caligal in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges, and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. Chapter 97. The Lamp. Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes, in merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, and eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his palate, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth in a Latin's lamp, and lays him down in it, so that in the pitchiest night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See, with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps often but hold bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oil, in its unmanufactured, and, therefore, unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore. It is sweet as early grass butter in April. He, goes and hunts for his oil, so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveler on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98. Stowing Down and Clearing Up. Already has it been related how the great Leviathan is afar off described from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors, and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded or two, becomes the property of his executioner, how, in due time, he is condemned to the pots, and, like Shara, Meshach, and Abengo, his spermacity, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire semicolon but now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing, if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into, the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities sliding along beneath the surface as before, but, alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six barrel casks, and while, perhaps, the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck, like so many landslides till at last man handled and stayed in their course, and all round the hoops, rap, rap, go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now, ex officio, every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pint is cast, and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and, down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced, and hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery, this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil, on the sacred quarter deck enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled, great rusty, casks lie about, as in a brewery yard, 
The smoke from the tribe works has besuited all the bulwarks, the mariners go about suffused with unctuousness, the entire ship seems great Leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you, and prick your ears in this self same ship, and were it not for the telltale boats and tri works, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel, with a most scrupulously neat commander. The unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides, from the ashes of the burnt scraps of the whale, a potent lie is readily made, and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lie quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the tri works, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight, all tackles are coiled in unseen nooks, and when by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions, shift themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow, as bridegrooms new leapt, from out the daintiest holland. Now, with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics, propose to mat the deck, think of having hanging to the top, object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint to such must mariners of oil, and bone, and blubber, were little short of audacity. They, know not the thing you distantly allude to. Away, and bring us napkins. But mark, aloft there, at the three mastheads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught, infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture, and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere. Yes, and many is the time, when, after the severest uninterrupted labors, which know no night, continuing, straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line comma they only step to the deck to carry vest chains, and heave the heavy windlass, and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial tri-works, when, on the heel of all this, they, have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship, and make a spotless dairy room of it, many is the time the poor fellows, just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks, are startled by the cry of their she blows. And away they fly to fight another whale, and go through the whole weary thing again. Oh! My friends, but this is man killing. Yet this is life. For hardly have we mortals by, long toilings extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then, with weary patience, cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done, when, there she blows exclamation mark the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world, and go through young life's old routine again. Oh! The metempsychosis! Oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece, two thousand years ago, did die, so good, so wise, so mild. I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green simple boy, how to splice a rope. Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter deck, taking regular turns at either limit, the binnacle and mainmast but in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause and turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular, object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose, and when resuming his walk he again paused before the main mast, then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, 
only dashed with, a certain wild longing, if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by the strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now for the first time beginning to interpret for himself in some monomaniac way whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and, the round world itself but an empty cipher, except to sell by the cartload, as they do hills about Boston, to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest, virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence, east and west, over golden sands, the headwaters of many a pactiless flows. And though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the, verdigris of copper spikes, yet, untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its keto glow. Nor, though placed amongst a ruthless crew and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the livelong nights shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where the sunset left at last. For it was set apart and, sanctified to one awe-striking end, and however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the wary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last, and whether he would ever live to spend it. Now those noble golden coins of South America are as metals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here bombs, alpacas, and volcanoes, sun's disks and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving, are in luxuriant profusion stamped, so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories, by passing through those fancy mints, so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the peak wine was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border, it bore the letters, Republica del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world, and beneath the great equator, and named after it, and it had been cast midway up the Andes, in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one aflame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountaintops and towers, and all other grand and lofty things, look here comma three peaks as proud as. Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab, the volcano, that is Ahab, the courageous, the undaunted, and victorious fowl, that, too, is Ahab, all are Ahab, and this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which, like a magician's glass, to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains for those who ask the world to solve them, it cannot solve, itself. Methinks now this coin sun wears a ruddy face, but see. I, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before he wheeled out of a former equinox at Aries. From storm to storm. So be it, then. Born in throes, tis fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it, then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it, then. No fairy fingers can have. Press the gold, but devil's claws must have left their moldings there since yesterday, murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below, let me read. A dark valley between three mighty, heaven abiding peaks, that almost seem the Trinity, in some faint earthly symbol. So in, this vale of death, God girds us round and over all our gloom, the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her moldy soil, but if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance halfway, to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture, and if, at midnight, we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This, coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, 
lest truth shake me falsely. There now's the old mogul, soliloquized stub by the triworks, he's been twigging it, and there goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long. And all from looking at a piece of gold, which did I have it now on Negro Hill or, in Coraller's hook, I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Humphrey. In my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings, your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Pope Ion, with plenty of gold moidores and pistoles, and joes, and half joes, and quarter joes, what then should there be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda. Let me read it once. Holoa. Here's signs and wonders truly. That, now, is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the zodiac, and what my almanac below calls ditto. I'll get the almanac and as I have heard devils can be raised with devil's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curvicues here with the Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders, and the sun, he's always among them. Hem, 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 here they are, here they go. All alive colon Aries, or the ram, Taurus, or the bull and Gemini. Here's Gemini himself, or the twins. Well, the sun he wheels among them. I, here on the coin he's just crossing the threshold between two of twelve, sitting rooms all in a ring. Book. You lie there, the fact is, you books must know your places. You'll do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar, and Bowditch's navigator, and Bowles arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs, and significant in wonders, there's a clue somewhere, wait a bit, hist, hark. By Jove, I have it. Look you, doubloon, your zodiac here is the life of man in one round chapter, and now I'll read it off, straight out of the book. Come, almanac. To begin, there's Aries, or the ram, lecherous dog, he begets us, then, Taurus, or the bull, he bumps us the first thing, then Gemini, or the twins, that is, virtue and vice, we try to, reach virtue, when lo, comes Cancer the crab, and drags us back, and here, going from virtue, Leo, a roaring lion, lies in the path, he gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw, we escape, and hail Virgo, the virgin. That's our first love, we marry and think to be happy for I, when pop comes Libra, or the scales, happiness weighed and found wanting, and while we are very sad about, that, Lord. How we suddenly jump, as Scorpio, or the scorpion, stings us in the rear, we are curing the wound, when wang come the arrows all round, Sagittarius or the archer, is amusing himself. As we pluck at the shafts, stand aside. Here's the battering ram, Capricornus, or the goat, full tilt, he comes rushing, and headlong we are tossed, when Aquarius, or the water bearer, pours out his, whole deluge and drowns us, and to wind up with Pisces, or the fishes, we sleep. There's a sermon now, written high heaven, and the sun goes through it every year and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty. Jollily he, aloft there, wheels through toil and trouble, and so, alow here, does jolly stub. Oh, jolly's the word for I. Adieu, doubloon. But stop, here comes little King Post, dodge, round the triworks, now, and let's hear what he'll have to say. There, he's before it, he'll out with something presently. So, so, he's beginning. I see nothing here, but a round thing made of gold, and whoever raises a certain whale, this round thing belongs to him. So, what's all this staring been about? It is worth sixteen dollars, that's true, and at two cents the cigar, that's nine hundred, and sixty cigars. I won't smoke dirty pipes like stub, but I like cigars, and here's nine hundred and sixty of them, so here goes flask aloft to spy him out. Shall I call that wise or foolish, now, if it be really wise it has a foolish look to it, yet, 
if it be really foolish, then has it a sort of wiseish look to it. But, avast, here comes our old manxman, the old hearse driver, he must have, been, that is, before he took to the sea. He luffs up before the doubloon, holloa, and goes round on the other side of the mast, why, there's a horseshoe nailed on that side, and now he's back again, what does that mean? Hark! He's muttering, voice like an old worn out coffee mill. Prick ears, and listen. If the white whale be raised, it must be in a month and a day, when the sun stands in some, one of these signs, I've studied signs, and know their marks, they were taught me two score years ago, by the old witch in Copenhagen. Now, in what sign will the sun then be? The horseshoe sign, for there it is, right opposite the gold. And what's the horseshoe sign? The lion is the horseshoe sign, the roaring and devouring lion. Ship, old ship. My old head shakes to think of thee. There's another rendering now, but still one text. All sorts of men in one kind of world, you see. Dodge again. Here comes Queegig, all tattooing, looks like the signs of the zodiac himself. What says the cannibal? As I live he's comparing notes, looking at his thigh bone, thinks the sun is in the thigh, or in the calf, or in the bowels, I suppose, as the old woman talks surgeon's astronomy in the back country. And by Jove, he's, found something there in the vicinity of his thigh, I guess it's Sagittarius, or the archer. Number he don't know what to make of the doubloon, he takes it for an old button off some king's trousers. But, aside again. Here comes that ghost devil, Fiedla, tail coiled out of sight as usual, a look him in the toes of his pumps as usual. What does he say, with that look of his? Ah, only makes a sign to the, sign and bows himself, there is a sun on the coin fire worshipper, depend upon it. Ho! Oh. More and more. This way comes Pip, poor boy. Would he had died, or I, he's half horrible to me. He too has been watching all of these interpreters, myself included, and look now, he comes to read, with that unearthly idiot face. Stand away again and hear him. Hark! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Marie's grammar. Improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now, hist? I look, you look, he looks, we look. Ye look, they look. Why, he's getting it by heart, hist. Again. I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they, are all bats, and I'm a crow, especially, when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw. 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 Ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers, and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me question mark complimentary exclamation mark poor lad exclamation mark I could go hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain, wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so. I leave him muttering. Here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But, unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly, too, for when all's nailed to the mast it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha, ha! Old Ahab! The white whale, he'll nail ye! This is, a pine tree. My father, in Old Holland County, cut down a pine tree once, and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection, when they come to fish up this old mast, and find a doubloon lodged in it, with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Oh, the gold! The precious, precious, gold! The green miser will hoard ye, soon. Hish! Hish! God goes among the world's black burying. Cook! Ho, cook. And cook us. Jenny. Hey, 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 Jenny, Jenny. And get
Chapter 100. Leg and Arm. The Pequot, of Nantucket, meets the Samuel Enderby, of London. Ship, ahoy! Hast seen the white whale? So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man, of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout, that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's circuit. Hast seen the white whale? See you this? And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. Man my boat! cried Ahab, impetuously, and tossing about the oars near him, stand by to lower. In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water, and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment, Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequot, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now, it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it, like, whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea, for the great swells now lift the boat high up towards the bulwarks, and then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the Kelson. So, deprived of one leg, and the strange ship of course being altogether unsupplied with a kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the, uncertain changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab. And in the present instance, all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship, leaning over the side, by the, perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there, and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented men ropes, for at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out. I see, I see, a vast heaving, there. Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle. As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft, and the massive curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who at once comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook, it was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor, or the crotch of an apple tree, and then giving the word, held himself fast, and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight, by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks, and gently landed upon the capstan head. With his ivory arm frankly thrust forth in welcome, the other, captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg, and crossing the ivory arm, like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, I, I, hearty. Let us shake bones together exclamation mark an arm and a leg exclamation mark an arm that never can shrink, gc, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale question mark how long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards, the east, and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope, there I saw him, on the line, last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan, and resting on the Englishman's shoulder, as he did so. Ay, he was the cause of it, at least, and that leg, too? Spin me the yarn, said Ahab, how was it? It was the first time in my life, that I ever cruised on the line, began the Englishman. I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. Well, one day we lowered for a pot of four or five whales, 
and my boat fastened to one of them, a regular circus horse he was, too, that went milling and milling round so, that my boat's crew could only trim dish, by sitting all their sterns on the outer gunwale. Presently up breaches from the, bottom of the sea a bouncing great whale, with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he, it was he! cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoon sticking in near his starboard fin. I, I, they were mine, my irons, cried Ahab, exultingly, but on. Give me a chance, then, said the Englishman, good humoredly. Well, this old, great grandfather, with the white head and hump, runs all a foam into the pod, and goes to snapping furiously at my fast line. I, I see exclamation mark wanted to part it, free the fast fish, an old trick, I know him. How it was exactly, continued the one armed commander, I do not know, but in biting the line, it got foul of his teeth, caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, so that when we, afterwards pulled on the line, bounce we came plump onto his hump. Instead of the other whales, that went off to windward, all fluking. Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, I resolved to capture him, spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in. And thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth it was, tangled to my draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale line, seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat, Mr. Mountop's here, by the way, Captain, Mountop, Mountop, the captain, as I was saying, I jumped into Mountop's boat, which, G.C., was gunnel and gunnel with mine, then, and snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it, but, Lord, look you, sir, hearts and souls alive, man, the next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat both eyes out, all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air, like a marble steeple. No use sterning all, then, but as I was groping at midday, with a blinding sun, all crown jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second, iron, to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a lima tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters, and, flukes first, the white hump back through the wreck, as though it was all chips. We all struck out. To escape his terrible flailings, I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But a combing sea dashed me off, and, at the same instant, the fish, taking one good dart forwards, went down like a flash, and the barb of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder, yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when? When, all of a sudden, thank the good God, the bar ripped its way along the flush, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated semicolon and that gentleman there will tell you the rest, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship's surgeon, Bunger, my lad comma the captain. Now, Bunger a boy, spin your part of the yarn. The professional gentleman thus familiarly pointed out, had been all the time standing near them, with nothing specific visible, to denote his gentlemanly rank on, board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one, he was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt, and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling's pike he held in one hand, and a pillbox held in the other, occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But, at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he, politely bowed, and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. It was a shocking bad wound, began the whale surgeon, and, taking my advice, Captain Boomer here, stood our old Sammy, Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship, interrupted the one-armed captain, addressing Ahab, go on, boy. Stood our old Sammy off to the northward, to get out of the blazing hot weather there on the line but it was no use, I did all I could, sat up with him nights, was very severe with him in the matter of diet, oh, very severe. Chimed in the patient himself, 
then suddenly altering his voice, drinking hot rum toddies with me every night, till he couldn't see to put on the bandages, and sending me to bed, half seas over, about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, ye stars! He sat up with me indeed, and was very severe in my diet. Oh! A great watcher, and very dietetically severe, is Dr. Bunger. Bunger, you dog, laugh out. Why don't ye? You know you're a precious jolly rascal, but, keep ahead, boy, I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man. My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir said the imperturbable godly looking bunger, slightly bowing to, Ahab, is apt to be facetious at times, he spends us many clever things of that sort. But I may as well say, in passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict total abstinence man, I never drink, water. Cried the captain, he never drinks it, it's a sort of fits to him, fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia, but go on, go on, with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon, coolly, I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that spite of my best and severest endeavors, the wound kept getting worse and worse, the truth was, sir, it was as ugly gaping wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black, I knew what was threatened, and off it came. But I had no hand in, shipping that ivory arm there, that thing is against all rule, pointing at it with the marling's pike, that is the captain's work, not mine, he ordered the carpenter to make it. He had that club hammer there put to the end, to knock some one's brains out with, I suppose, as he tried mine once. He flies into diabolical passions sometimes. Do ye see the stent, sir removing his hat, and brushing, aside his hair, and exposing a bow-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scary trace, or any token of ever having been a wound, well, the captain there will tell you how that came here, he knows. No, I don't, said the captain, but his mother did, he was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you, you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunger, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog, you should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. What became of the white whale? Now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this by play between the two Englishmen. Oh! cried the one-armed captain, oh, yes. Well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time, in fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what, whale it was that had served me such a trick, till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line, we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he. Did thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten. Didn't want to try to ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? And I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well, then, interrupted Bunger, give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence? that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it too. So that, what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness. For he never means to swallow a single limb, he only thinks to terrify by faints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe swallow jackknives, once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest and there it stayed for a twelve-month or more, when I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do ye see? No possible way for him to digest the jackknife, and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system. Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it, and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving decent burial to the other, why in that case the arm is yours, only let the whale have another chance at you, shortly that's all. No, thank ye, Bunger, said the English captain, he's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it, 
and didn't know him then, but not to another one. No more white whales for me, I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that, and there is a shipload of precious sperm in him, but, hark ye, he's best let, alone, don't you think so, Captain? Glancing at the ivory leg. He is. But he will still be hunted, for all that. What is best let alone, that accursed thing is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou sawst him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul, and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunger, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog, strangely snuffing, this, man's blood bring the thermometer exclamation mark it's at the boiling point exclamation mark his pulse makes these planks beat exclamation mark sir. Taking a lancet from his pocket, and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast! roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks, man the boat. Which way heading? Good God! cried the English captain, to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think Dot is your captain, crazy! whispering Fiedla. But Fiedla, putting a finger on his lip, slid over the bulwarks to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him. With back to the stranger ship, and face set like a flint to his own, Ahab stood upright till alongside.